Well, I'd like to, uh, as usual, thank the organizers uh, in the KITP for the invitation. This is my second time here. Um, uh, first time, uh, Joe Polchinski was still alive. Joe Polchinski was at the University of Texas when I uh, was a grad student, and he was very uh, important in the education of the grad students. He was always ready to talk physics. And for me in particular, it was I learned quite a bit from him. It's a pity that he's no longer with us. In the meantime, uh, we also lost my advisor, Steven Weinberg, last year. So uh, for me, quite a number of losses in the last few years of mentors. But this is a festive occasion. We are finally uh, in person here. Um, I'm going to take off my mask. If someone objects, please let me know. I'll put it back on. Um, I arrived at ALX uh, yesterday, last night, and I'm still, I feel I'm still rushing to get here. So uh, hopefully the delivery of the talk is not going to be too, uh, too rough. So I'd like to, to talk about bosons and multi-component fermions uh, near the unitarity limit. Since I'm the first speaker, I'm going to spend, I guess, some time uh, with uh, some things that most of us know uh, what uh, unitarity is and why we're interested in it. And then uh, also talk about some uh, interesting consequences of unitarity that are well known, in particular discrete scale invariance in uh, many body systems, and then go to results on, on the various uh, items here and then conclude. I apologize in advance, this is an interdisciplinary uh, meeting. I'm sure I'm not going to, to be able to uh, cite everybody properly, um, but uh, I'll try when I can. So why are we, well, why are, why am I interested in unitarity? Um, so I'm, uh, in general, in many situations, we, we face a situ uh, systems that are non-relativistic with short range interactions. And in that case, we might be interested in distance scales that uh, are much larger than the range of, of the potential. In that case, there is a way to, to deal with the systems that is quite elementary from uh, the physics perspective. We just do a multiple expansion uh, and consider the two body potential to be an expansion in uh, delta functions. Now, this is a quantum multipole expansion. So you have to be a bit careful with that. The delta functions, as we all know, are singular interactions. So we have to regularize uh, these interactions, and, which means introduction of, of some parameter with, with mass dimensions. And then, because, well, this is something we do by hand, we have to uh, renormalize the system at the end. We have to make sure that the errors introduced by this arbitrary procedure are no larger than a truncation that we are going to make in, on this expansion here. Although if we don't do a truncation, we have no predictive power. So for that, we, it means that we need cutoffs or regulator uh, parameters that are at least as large as the inverse size of uh, the interaction range to make sure that these errors from, uh, from the remaining cutoff dependence are not larger than the truncation of the series. Uh, maybe this is a good point to emphasize that I'm going to use uh, standard units here, uh, natural units where H bar and C are one, which makes all the scales uh, related. That for me, it's a bit easier. It's not always, I don't know if it's always used in, in atomic physics, it's not always used in nuclear physics, but I'm going to use here. Um, so I'm talking uh, alternatively in terms of momenta or inverse positions and so on, without H bars there in the middle. Um, now, it's been long, known for a long time that this expansion here, this quantum multiple expansion here at the two body level is equivalent to in expansion of the, expan uh, the effective range expansion of beta and so on. The effective range expansion means that the uh, T matrix, which is essentially the S matrix plus minus one, is given by a form like this, where A2 is the scattering length, R2 is called the effective range, and then there are other parameters. K is the, the scattering momentum, and then there are corrections from higher waves and so on. And the unitary, well, the, the range parameters typically are on this, of the size of the potential range. Uh, and so is the case for the scattering length, but in certain fine tuning situations, 
the, the inverse scattering lengths can, I mean, the scattering lengths can be infinite and the, uh, the, infinite, uh, the inverse scattering lengths go to zero. In that case, it's approximately given by the binding energy of the two body system if there is a bound state uh, or if there is a virtual, virtual state. Um, so this defines the unitarity limit. Uh, I prefer to think in terms of the unitarity window in a physical system, in a physical system where this is, there is this fine tuning and there is a gap between these two scales, then we can look, we might be interested in looking at momentum, uh, momentum in, the, in the middle. And in that case, the amplitude is approximately given by a form that is parameter free. And then corrections that are power series in, in K times R, but also uh, includes an inverse, uh, ex an expansion in the inverse of K times A2. Um, people in general like this, uh, this uh, form here because, well, you see that at leading order, there is no parameter. So any system will, uh, that in this unitarity window will uh, uh, be described by the same formula. So there's a large amount of universality. Uh, and to achieve this, in my, uh, so if I go through the algebra of, of the renormalization of this theory, I find out that that leading order coefficient for the delta function interaction, I only need that one, and that coefficient scales as one over one over the cutoff. Then I get this this first term here. Uh, people call this a non-trivial fixed point because the fixed point of the uh, renormalization group where the expansion around it is not perturbative. Now, the interesting uh, thing about this, from my perspective, is that that means that the amplitude is scale invariant at that order. Scale invariance continues, uh, 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 scale invariant. Uh, continuous scale uh, transformation is one that you just increase, uh, normal relativistically is one that you just increase the position, I mean, the, the, the distances according to a parameter alpha, which is continuous and time has to scale in a slightly different way because it's a non-relativistic system. And then because uh, momentum is inverse of position and energy is related to time, we have the scaling is for momentum and energy. And as long as the field scale is uh, canonical dimensions, then you see that with this formula here, that this action is scale invariant because the cutoff also the cutoff is a momentum cutoff, so it scales with, uh, with the, same, the same parameter. So, uh, so scale invariance, if you will, is a consequence of, of properly renormalizing this, this uh, quantum multipole expansion. Now, for, I'm interested in this because for nucleons uh, in nuclear physics, the scattering lengths are large compared to the range of the interaction, which is given by the inverse of the pi and mass while the effective ranges are uh, comparable to the inverse of the pi and mass. Uh, here are the, the numbers for the, well, in the, in, for nucleons, you have possibility of two S-wave channels according to whether spins are aligned or anti-aligned, the 3S1 and 1S0 channel. And uh, you can read the numbers here, you see that the, the scattering lengths are uh, large in those units. Uh, in atomic physics, where the, you can think of the van der Waals length as a sort of uh, range of the potential, uh, we have a system like helium, uh, hel bosonic helium-4, where uh, the numbers are not too different from, uh, from some of the numbers that you have in nuclear physics. And then, of course, as you all know, we can also go uh, close to Feshbach resonances, where we can even fine-tune this, this scattering length to be very, very close to, to infinity. So a number of systems fall within uh, this, what, I mean, has have a separation scales between the, the, the scattering length and, and the range of the potential for which we might be able to, which we might be able to describe with a theory that's the same or very similar for the different systems. So what I want to talk about in this talk is uh, uh, the possibility of doing a perturbative expansion around this unitarity limit. Now, many people talk about proximity of the unitarity limit in a general sense. I mean in a specific sense of being perturbatively close to the unitarity limit. Uh, why do I insist in perturbative? Well, first of all, if I want, if the corrections are truly small, they should be amenable to 
to perturbation theory. Uh, that then allows us to focus a leading order on the essential parameters and symmetries of the problem. And then uh, an extra difficulty that we have here is that because we have singular interactions, uh, it's very hard and in general, I mean, it's in general not possible uh, to renormalize the theory if we don't treat these more singular interactions that come as corrections uh, in perturbation theory. Um, so I'm going to see to which extent, I'm going to, my, my point is to try to see to which extent we can deal with a perturbative ex, uh, expansion around the unitarity limit. Now, this is at, so far at the two body level. Um, doesn't, at that level doesn't matter much what my particles are as long as they are non relativistic. Uh, things have become more interesting when we include more particles. And here the behavior becomes very different whether we have two component fermions or multi-component fermions and bosons. Uh, in the two-component fermion case, uh, there, is, there are no finite energy bound states as a consequence of scale invariance, assuming that it's not anomalously broken. There is no evidence for, for that. Uh, and you form the bound states by putting them in a trap. If you do that, then you introduce another scale, the, 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 the size of the trap, which then gives rise to a density, to a fermion momentum, you know, there is a parameter with dimensions, which is the Fermi momentum, only one. So in the unitarity limit, so you can derive the number of relations. Uh, well, you can formulate a number of relations based on dimension analysis. And uh, the most famous one is by, by Birch saying that, well, the, the energy per particle for a large number of particles then is a dimensionless number times uh, the free, free gas uh, value. And uh, then we can, it's universal in the sense that different systems uh, of two component fermions will have the, uh, the same, the same Birch parameter. Uh, I'm interested in this other case uh, because, well, I find it, uh, it has richer structures. So most of you know, know this story. If I now go with my theory, my quantum multipole expansion at leading order, I go to the three body system. Thomas already found in 1935 that uh, the binding energy of the three body system collapses, namely it grows with the cutoff to the second power. Uh, this is a nice plot that uh, my graduate student Fang Wu, which is in the audience, produced uh, at, the, at Unitarity um, to show this behavior. And this is of course unacceptable because we have a dependence on the regulator. So the way to uh, to eliminate that dependence is to do what we always do in any situation where we achieve we want to achieve renormalization. We have to include the interactions that uh, infor, uh, that guarantee that this binding energy will be independent of the cutoff, and that in this it's a three-body force because my two-body uh, my extra two-body interactions are also bleeding. So I need something else at leading order, and the only possibility is a three-body force which is going to be a product of two regulated delta functions. Now, the amazing thing is that if you, again, you go through the renormalization procedure and this we have done zillions of years ago, you find out that this three body force is on our RG limit cycle. So it has an approximate form given here in terms of, of a number, uh, a pure number as zero, which is close to one. Um, and, uh, the situation we are facing here is completely analogous to the breaking of scale invariance in QCD uh, that gives rise to, uh, to asymptotic freedom and so on. The parameter with dimensions emerges, then we call, uh, we call this lambda star, and uh, you see that uh, this force is periodic. Um, and because of this dependence here, then if I now consider my, my action, including this term here, again, you do the transformation, the scale transformation, you're going to see that this remains invariant under a scale transformation as long as the scaling parameter is now discrete. So this is discrete scale invariance. And this form comes from the constraint that this has to, to remain uh, invariant up to this overall factor here. So, which is necessary to account for the extra dimensions of these operators. So again, this creates scale invariance, this systems emerges from renormalization of, 
of the theory. So there are two, co two major consequences for this. Again, most of you know all this stuff here. The first one is that uh, the relation for the uh, transformation of energy that you have here um, can be satisfied now with non-trivial non results because you can relate with this discrete set of numbers. You can uh, relate the binding energies of different states. And when you solve this equation, then you obtain uh, the famous ephemeral of tower of states. Um, why Efimov uh, doesn't get the Nobel Prize for this work uh, for me is a mystery because to me this is this precedes and it is even well it's equally interesting to uh, asymptotic freedom um, but anyway uh, I'm not going to that sociology so this was discovered by Efimov by other means a long time ago uh, but now we have a formulation in terms of a Hamiltonian formulation you can go to the four body system and uh, for bosons, you can consider more. And people here in the audience have worked on this. And uh, you have also tower, as you must have, also towers um, of, of states for the systems. But with the interesting twist that um, there is a du dupl duplication, doubling the number of towers as you go from uh, one number, uh, from a certain number of particles to the next. I like to call this the theme of descendants. And the consequence is that we have this huge, rich structures of towers upon towers as we increase the number of particles. So this is very well known. I, well, that's not what I uh, am mostly interested about. I'm interested in another consequence of the discrete scale invariance, which, is, which are correlations between the ground state energies. So, um, now, because there is only one essential parameter in leading order, it was lambda star, which I can determine, for example, from the three-body system, it means that in leading order, the binding energies per particle are of other systems uh, must be related to that, to the binding energy per particle of the three-body system, uh, with set a, a set of universal numbers that depend on the number of particles. By definition of unitarity, this, this kappa two is zero, uh, by the way, uh, by the, it's, this is an identity four a equals three, and then uh, the number four uh, four particles has been calculated by Hummer and Platter and by many other people, uh, something like three point five. This number here, um, and then uh, the question is, what are these universal numbers for a large number of particles? And this was uh, studied by a number of people, including also other people in the audience here, and I'm going to mention that work in just a second. Um, so this is, uh, this relation here just embodies a uh, correlation between energies of, of different number of particles that was known empirically for, for a long time. For A equals four, this is what, this is, this can be represented by what's called the Thion line. You vary it, there is a linear relation between this and that, um, which was discovered empirically in, with uh, in nuclear physics, but also in verified in atomic, uh, for atomic potentials. Uh, and within, in this context was derived by Platter and company already a long time ago. And for bosons, for five and six bosons and more, if you, if you are strong enough uh, calculationally, you can, you have generalized relations which are just consequence of this. And uh, this was calculated by Bazak, uh, Bazak and collaborators. Um, so let me mention them briefly that uh, result for bosons. Uh, my understanding is that uh, the main author there, uh, Stefano, is going to talk about this in more detail in his talk, uh, I believe on Wednesday. Uh, so let me not spend too much time and, uh, but well, we can calculate the binding energy per particle normalized to the, to the one for the three body system. And what you observe, is uh, in the beginning a linear growth, approximately linear growth. And uh, I think Dorta in her first, uh, in her talk in the, uh, in the program, what, two weeks ago already mentioned that. Uh, but uh, so if this continued to happen, well, that would be a disaster. The system would never uh, be stable as you increase the number of, of, of particles. But what we, find is a behavior that the system saturates 
namely the set of numbers kappa n, approach uh, a finite value as n goes to, to infinity. Oh, now I realize that in some of the slides I'm using a for the number of particles and here I'm using n, but okay, sorry for the inconsistency. But anyway, it has, it approaches a, a, a limiting value which we extract from, uh, from a fit with this formula here to the data points. Our data points here, though, you should trust the ones that are the ones that uh, larger cutoff, which are the ones in, in blue here. Uh, so you see the fit that we that we get and that we extract this this the the bulk uh, binding momentum, if you want, and the contributions from from surface corrections. And uh, we also did a calculation on, on with uh, finite number part particles on a box with periodic uh, boundary conditions, and then the results are consistent with this. So this extrapolation should be. Reliable. This is a calculation that is uh, very similar to what has been done by Panhari Pan and collaborators many, many years ago for helium 4. And uh, the parameters are of the same magnitude, although there's a factor of 2 um, for kappa infinity, which uh, might mean that the, the, the helium 4 liquid is, is outside the, uh, the regime of an expansion. But okay, that's something to be studied. Uh, uh, maybe I should uh, uh, skip this slide because this was just to try to convince you that there is saturation, but uh, Stefan is going to talk more about this. Um, so now what's the situation for, uh, for fermions? So once we go, fermions now have a, an added physics that once we go beyond, well, if you have four component uh, fermions, once you go beyond four particles, you're going to find effects from the Pauli exclusion principle. So your numbers kappa that are universal for bosons and universal for fermions, they are not the same for bosons and fermions. So the question is what are those kappas for, uh, for fermions, for multi-component fermions? So this is a calculate, these are the results for, for the case of four component uh, fermions. Of course, we're doing this because we're interested in nucleons, which we can think of for component fermions, two degrees of freedom for spin, two for isospin. And uh, so we did a calculation, uh, or more precisely Dawkins uh, in uh, Alex Gerzelis did a calculation for the, uh, for the eight body system, also with uh, Monte Carlo, in, as a function of cutoff, and what we found out is that uh, around the unitarity, uh, in the unitarity limit, that uh, as we increase the cutoff, our ground state converges to the two, the two four body uh, state. So, in fact, our wave function looks like uh, two separate states, which then suggests that we do not have a stable state in the limit of a large cutoff that the uh, ground state is uh, either very close or exactly the system of two, uh, four, uh, two four body uh, systems. This of course is consistent with nuclear physics with the fact that beryllium eight is not bound, um, but okay, uh, we, we're not able to, to show whether there is a resonance like a low energy resonance like in beryllium eight. But this does suggest that together with all the calculations that I'm not describing here away from the unitarity limit, but with the same quantum multiple expansion that maybe clustering is a universal property of multi-component unitary fermions. Um, there is uh, later in the program, I think uh, uh, Lorenzo Contessi is going to, I believe, talk about some related work uh, about trying to understand what's happening once we go uh, beyond four. Uh, anyway, uh, what I conclude from this is that it's quite a lot of structure already at unitary. There are the towers, there is, in case of bosons, there is saturation that's coming from this three body force, essentially stabilizing the system. Uh, and then for multi-component fermions, we have this, this uh, most likely this cluster structures uh, as being gener generalized. So now the question is, is, is the leading order of an expansion around the unitarity limit 
can we do a perturbative expansion around it and get uh, still uh, reasonable physics. So this perturbative expansion, of course, because the leading order is not free, it's a distorted wave, uh, it's a distorted wave perturbation theory. Uh, people used to know what that, that was if you look at any uh, old quantum mechanics book. Um, so for that, we are going to use, uh, thank you, an expansion where the next to leading order is just the first, first insertion of the corrections. And the corrections are of several types. There are, of course, going to be range corrections. There is the inverse of the scattering length. Those we have already included and the results I'm going to show you soon. Uh, there might be Coulomb interactions. That's important in, in the nuclear physics case. And what's more surprising is that there is a four body force that appears at next to leading order for renormalization uh, results that I'm also going to show in the few minutes that I have left. Um, so just very quickly, um, am I going to show you this? Uh, maybe I'm going to skip, well, let me go very quickly. I mean, uh, just to test this, we look at helium-4 atoms. Uh, for helium-4 atoms, there is not a whole lot of uh, information, experimental information in the few body system. So what we use as uh, test ground are phenomenological potentials in two of them in particular. And we use those because the numbers for these potentials have been calculated by, by several people. Uh, and uh, they are listed here. So we use them as test grounds of the effect field theory by fitting the parameters of the effect field theory to this, uh, to, to this quote unquote data and then making predictions for, for other observables. Of course, this can be improved if there are, there's more experimental data, but just to see how the, 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 the theory goes, this is away from unitarity, right? So this is for helium-4 atoms, away from unitarity. You'll see the result at leading order if we fit the, the excited state of the trimer. Uh, we get uh, leading order that is not too different for the ground state compared to the cal direct calculations. And in the four, uh, same thing for the red line and the four body system compared with the, with the calculated lines uh, here by some people in the audience. Uh, this is, these are the red lines. And then when we go to next to leading order, we find a disaster. But when we include only the two body effector range, we find that our results are not renormalized. They go completely bananas with with a, with a cutoff which means that the four body says the uh, force is needed a, a sub leading or an next leading order fitted to the four body system and then you see how the results improve uh, compared to the exact results so a four body force not only renormalizes the system but also uh, allows us to do the perturbation theory around the unitary uh, well around the leading order so at unitarity the situation for uh, is this for the two, three, and four body systems? This is what happens for helium four clusters if I take the numbers from the potential models. Uh, and uh, I show the results away from unit with leading order not being unitarity. We are working on corrections to the unitarity limit, both for doing a full and a low calculation for uh, small systems, and then including the one over a corrections in the uh, in the bosonic case that I mentioned before. In the few minutes that I want, that I have left, let me go, go to the nuclear case. So again, unitarity here. Uh, for light nuclei, because these are fermions, there are a few more states that we have to worry about. Here's the deuteron. There is a split from isospin violation uh, between the triton and helium. There is an ND virtual state that uh, is a rem rem remnant of uh, the rest of the FMOV tower, there is an alpha particle, an excited alpha uh, state of the alpha particle, and then there are P wave uh, levels there. Um, we can calculate at NLO the splitting between helium, uh, uh, helium, uh, helium and uh, helion and uh, triton. And this is what we get compared to experiment after we fit the ground state. Uh, then we go to the four body system we have at the unitarity, we have a Tion line and that line gets moved very close to the experimental point at NLO where NLO includes only the scattering length. So this is not a complete NLO. The results have been, there are results also 
from uh, Sebastian Koenig uh, for uh, the point charge radii at incomplete NLO uh, compared to, to experiment here. And again, we are working on a full NLO calculation, mostly my student Frank who is here. Uh, and then uh, Lorenzo Contesi uh, for bigger systems. So let me conclude because I have no time left, I've been told. So uh, messages, so systems, the type of systems, multi-component fermions and bosons, that unitarity can be described essentially by this one parameter and by discrete scale invariance that results that discrete scale invariance comes from renormalization. Uh, boson saturate and form a quantum liquid, multi-component fermions tend to clusterize and this expansion around, unitar around the unitarity works for light nuclei, but we are trying to extend for bosons and beyond light nuclei. Thank you for your attention. For questions, and uh, please use the microphones. Um, either come up to one if you have a question, or we can try to run one to you if you're close to someone with the mic. Uh, So this is a very simple question. So since you have the conclusion, so it says systems near unitarity can be described by essentially one parameter. So if you take uh, uh, by systems, I mean multi-component fermions and bosons, right? Okay, so just a single component to sound a guess. Uh, how is this parameter then related to? Is it related to the free body parameter? Yeah, yeah, it is the free body parameter. It's, so nothing else matters. It doesn't matter. Well, I mean, that's the word essentially, right? That's that means in a expansion around the unitary. So this is at unitarity. That's there was one parameter, mm -hmm. and in an expansion around the unitary. So around the unitarity, this is the one leading order parameter. The, my leading order Hamiltonian has one parameter on the side. And, and that I can choose to, since it first appears in the three-body system, I can choose to determine it from the three-body uh -huh. binding energy. That's a natural thing to do. And, and would you expect the same to happen if you, so a big uh, thing in cool atoms is this impurity that is. So you put an impurity into. To okay, so I, maybe I, I, should, I should have emphasized that all the results that are presented here are for equal Particles, I mean, to identical particles, okay. right? So, it's would you do with the same, same thing to have mass. Or... To, to the extent that I have discrete scale okay. invariance, yes. I mean, again, I have to do the calculation of mm -hmm. the, the three body system, renormalize it. If I have a need for a uh, three body parameter, uh, for a three body force for renormalization reasons, mm -hmm. then yes. And in some cases, you will, depending on how many interactions are sufficiently strong, you will have in some other cases you want. Thanks. I, I should emphasize that I'm very simple minded. I mean, I'm just following the same procedure that I followed for any other theory anywhere else in physics. When it's quantum, I have to renormalize it and I see what renormalization gives. And I do that for every different system that I consider and what you see what the outcome is. And in this case is discrete scale invariance at leading order. And there's one parameter in leading order. Is it on? Yeah, I was just wondering in the, the kinds of plots you were showing where you're dividing by the the three the energy of the three body system. How do you how do you see, for instance, like a competition between discrete and continuous scale invariance in these yeah, kinds no, of things? No, the, the, the scale invariance, the continuous scale invariance is only for the two-body system. Uh, it's, but, but you were right, the fact that there is a single parameter, uh, if I had, uh, I mean, that, that in itself, just, it's a dimensionful parameter, so I'm already destroying scale invariance, right? So what I, the only thing that I have is discrete scale invariance once I'm beyond the, the three-body system. So I'm not sure what else I, I, I mean, once, once I'm beyond the two-body system, I already don't have scale well, invariance just, anymore because scale yeah. invariance would, if I had it exactly, would forbid any bound states, right? Because to have a discrete state, I, would, I need to have some scale. 
Yeah, I guess so, I guess I was just thinking you you build up the number of particles and then you get like a density <laughs> or more of a frequency uh, or whatever. And well, these are cell, these are these are uh, these are self-bound systems, right? This is a cluster. So uh, they have they form nuclei or clusters in the atomic case. So uh, I don't need to put the system in a box. So I'm looking at the, the, the system that self-bound that results, which is a liquid and not a, a gas, right? So it has, uh, doesn't have any particular structure. Uh, so it's not a solid, uh, I think. So it's, it's a liquid, it's not a gas either. I don't need the walls to define the density of the system. Of course, the system has a certain density profile, uh, which I went very quickly over, which is, is here as a function of the distance in some natural, uh, in, in terms of the natural scale in the system. And you see that it has a behavior that you'd expect. It, it, it has a, a more or less flat density in the center, goes to zero, has a relatively uh, thick skin, and, but it's a self-bound system, right? Thank you. Oh, question online. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. How do you see the question? Ah, the hand there. Oh, where is, I don't see. Can any. you ask your question? Uh, directly, uh, Damson, are you on oh, hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Ira, hi, Ira. Um, hi. I have a question. Um, how do we know that, how, how, how can I understand that uh, effective field theory can be applied to the bound liquid, is there a separation of scale between the distance between particles in the liquid and the range of the potential? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, for helium-4, I don't know necessarily if that's, that's the case, but we can, uh, I mean, this, uh, the, the, the next state, uh, the next deeper state in the three-body system, right, is going to be 500 times uh, deeper than the state that, that I take as reference, whatever that state is, right? So it's correct that I need to have my, if this number here was bigger than 500, I knew for sure that this was outside the, the regime of validity of the theory. So there's going to be a, my effect field theory is going to, it's kind of hard to, because I think if I, if I talk to there, I, I, uh, someone sees that I'm talking to him, but to talk with him, I need to uh, to look here. Um, so uh, I need to, this number cannot be 500, right? If it's 500, it means that for sure, I'm going to be beyond the limit of validity of the theory. Mm -hmm. This number is smaller than, than, than 500, which means that the typical momentum of this state that I'm calculating is still way, uh, I mean, it's not as bound as the next, uh, the next state, which I would say is the limit for validity of my effect field theory. Mm -hmm. uh, in, an, in the real world, I don't, the limit is, it's going to be somewhere in between the state that I take as reference in the deeper state that's outside my effect field theory. And the unitarity point is going to be somewhere here. So whether the, the breakdown scale is going to be, uh, uh, inside or not, that I don't know. It's going to depend on the specific. So in other words, whether I can apply this as a starting point for a physical system like helium-4, uh, that I don't know a priori, and I need to go to NLO, which will carry information about the breakdown scale uh, and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And how far in fermions? Case, do you expect that to go? Can you go to carbon 12 and still uh, treat that? Yeah, so for, for, for fermions, yeah, we can, uh, in principle, we can uh, go to, uh, for example, oxygen 16, which we have done away from unitarity. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, our, this calculation started for oxygen 16, but then we, we decided to, to focus on, on the simpler case. 
uh, here. But in principle, yeah, you can you can go in. As I said, the indications in the case where we don't start from unitarity, but still use pi on the ZFT, which is what we use here, is that uh, it continues to the, the ground state continues to be the the free uh, four body the collection of free four body states, which then poses the question of how we which I should have emphasized during the talk, the question of how we can hope to get what we get in the real world, for example, for nucleons, which is uh, bound systems, I mean, sorry, stable systems, namely for oxygen 16, the ground state is below the, the four alpha threshold. Can we do that in perturbation theory? That's not entirely clear. Mm -hmm. if, and if so, how? Thank you. Thanks. Hi, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, you show the, uh, um, the energy levels of nuclear physics, and uh, you had also an excited state of half particles. You mean this one? Next no. one, I think. Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah. You have uh, the alpha this. star. Right. Can you describe, uh, the, uh, can you describe the resonance of alpha particle? I don't know what the next drilling order or it's a... Excellent question. We haven't done the NLO, the full NLO calculation, right? Um, the only calculation we have at NLO is this incomplete calculation that we did here for, for the ground state, right? Uh, which is only including the one over a, one over a correction, which is also what, uh, what was shown in this plot that I went very quickly through. Uh, to do the, to answer a question, we need to do the full NLO because the NLO is what splits triton and helium, right? So, uh, uh, as we showed in the, in some other plot. So, uh, in the order. It comes only from Coulomb interaction? Or? Yeah, this order only from Coulomb. That's a good question also. I didn't have time to, uh, if you treat Coulomb non-perturbatively, then there is a, um, namely, if you treat it as leading order, then at the NLO, there is a new parameter that you then cannot, then you'd have to fit to the, to the splitting. But these states are, are, are uh, still relatively deep. So we can uh, treat Coulomb in perturbation theory. So comes at NLO and it, we can renormalize the system without a new counter term. Other than a change in the, other than the two body counterturn that gives rise to the scattering length. So there is no unknown, uh, as a spin break in contribution at NLO. And that's the reason for, uh, the fact that we could actually predict, uh, here I, I was rushing like, like mad. I mean, it's, it, what you need to compare is the green line here with this line here. That's this, this number here. And you can see how well it works. I think it works well for a NLO calculation without a free parameter. Thanks. Uh, we have a couple minutes left. Is there are more questions. I think Alejandro has a question now. Yes. When you talk about the four body force in, in helium, no? It, uh, in my naive rationing, the data is coming from a two-body potential, which is the LM2 and 2 or another. So mm -hmm. in my, uh, for bosons, no? The right. data you use it is... Uh, the delta, what? The what data, the data. The data, oh, okay, the yeah. Data. So my, in my reason, I say, if you increase the order of the expansion, because the data is coming from a two-body potential, I will think that increasing the, the orders, the three-body force, will reduce the, uh, because you start contracting the two body force. Instead, a four body force appears. What, so what is the, your comment on, on, on that? Okay, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what, what you want to hear, but I'm going to comment what I want to say, which is that first of all, four body force is there, right? The, there some, seems to be some prejudice among certain people that three and four body forces don't exist and they are something that I pull out of my, my sleeves. Three and four body forces and five body forces, whatever, are allowed by the symmetry, so they are there. So it's not a question of 
whether they appear, but whether they appear at this order or at some higher order. So why do they appear at this order? It doesn't really depend on the data. Uh, it's, you can see from this curve here, this is, in order to produce this exact curve, it's true that we took the, the factor range parameters from some potential, no, we can, we can but we could take, to have taken from one different potential and it would still go like this in a four body system at NLO. So uh, it's, it's not, my, my, my conclusion that the four body force is NLO is follows only from renormalization in a situation where the effective range is small enough to be treated in perturbation theory, which is what you're interested in around the unitarity limit. It doesn't depend on other assumptions. Of course, I have to have such a potential that the effective range is of the order of the range of the potential, and therefore it's treatable in perturbation theory. But once I have that condition, the four body force is there, imposed on me by renormalization, like discrete scale invariance is imposed on me by renormalization, like asymptotic freedom is imposed on me by, by renormalization. Okay, I think we've exhausted okay. the, the time for the okay. Q&A. So let's thank uh, Bira again. Thank you.